Did you know that backpropagation can be generalized to work with different semi-rings and give us interpretable insights about... Hold on, hold on. Wait, what? Let's back up from the start. So what is backpropagation? Backprop is a dynamic programming algorithm which enables super efficient computation of the derivatives of big functions. To be clear, it works for small functions too, but it really shines when you have a ginormous function with tons of parameters, <coughs> neural networks. Why do we care about backprop? Well, the answer is it's everywhere in modern ML. Everything from basic building blocks like logistic regression to fancy big names like GPT, BERT, Diffusion, all depend on this one cool algorithm for learning. And it's also useful for interpretability because it helps in reasoning about which parts of an input does the model predicate its prediction on most. Backprop enables us to approximate a counterfactual of, okay, if this input changed in this way, how does that affect the output? So this is cool and abstract and all, but can we get some math and symbols that definitely won't be confusing? Let's do it. So we start with the function f. f is a big function. That means it has a lot of parameters, like a million or a trillion or IDK. Who knows what the big guys are up to these days? Let's call that theta. It takes in an input, which is represented by a bunch of features. So it's actually a function operating on a bunch of inputs, your features. Let's call those x1 to xn. When you pass f your input x, which is really x1 to xn, it does a bunch of math and magic with the parameters theta and finally produces an output prediction. Now, ML works by comparing that output to the right answer, we'll call that Y, and seeing how bad it screwed up, that's the loss function. And then here's where derivatives are important. What's a derivative? It's an approximation for the rate of change of one thing with respect to another. If we take the, the derivative of this loss with respect to each parameter in theta, then we can see how much the loss changes by tweaking each parameter, and then you can actually tweak the parameters and see if it gets better, and so on and so forth. Now that's the derivative with respect to the parameters theta, important for learning. But on the other hand, if you take the derivative with respect to x1 and xn, then you can approximate how much the loss changes with respect to each input. That is, if I tweak this guy, will it screw up or change the prediction a lot? If it does, then maybe that is important. Okay, coolio. So now how do you compute the derivative of super nested functions? The answer is, you break it down by a thing called a computation graph. What's a computation graph? Let's see an example. Here's a function with two inputs. You can break this f into a sequence of elementary operations. First, x gets e, then you do x minus y, then you multiply the x minus y by y, then you add the e to x with the x minus y by y thing, and ta-da, if you follow that sequence, you get your answer. Now, how do you find the derivative of f with respect to your inputs? It's easy. You find every path in the graph from x of the input, and you sum the derivatives from that path. Wait, how do you find the derivative from a path? Well, you just multiply the local derivative between each edge in that path. Let me say that again, because this is really important. To compute the gradient of f with respect to an input, you look at a path from the input to the output, and you multiply all the edge weights of the path together. Then you do that for every path between input and output, and add it all up. It's a sum of products. But wait, isn't that really super duper terribly expensive? Because what if the graph is super duper big, and then you're just computing this thing for an exponential number of paths? Enter backprop. It takes advantage of the fact that, well, a lot of these paths actually share a lot of computation. Instead of exhaustively enumerating every single path and multiplying every single edge along every single path, backprop works backward and accumulates shared values at each node in the graph so that later ones can reuse this work when it's their turn and avoid redoing all of it. And voila, suddenly you go from exponential work to linear in the number of edges in the graph. Now why does this work? It's actually because the multiplication is distributive over addition. Think about it this way. If you have a node that points into a node which then branches into multiple paths, how would you find the sum of the products of each edge value along each path? Well, for the first path, you do the first edge times the second edge times the third edge and so on. And for the second path, you do the first edge times the second edge times the third edge and so on. But the cool thing is that the first edge is the same for every path. It's always that value from the first node into the next node. Since it's the same, that means we're adding a bunch of potentially different things that are multiplied by definitely the same thing, and that means we can factor out the same thing based on the distributive property of real numbers, and that means instead of recomputing the value along every single path individually in summing, if we save the accumulated sum at a node one step ahead, we can just multiply once and get the sum of every path way, way faster, withholding just a bit of it in memory. Now, couldn't this work for any system with the distributive property? What if we freed ourselves from the limits of the sum and product over reals? 
and generalize to something more? The answer is an algebraic structure called a semiring, which has all these nice properties and the key constraint that whatever your sum and product operation are, they have to be distributive because that's what lets backpropagation work. Now here's some cool semi-rings with interesting interpretations. The standard sum product semi-ring over reals is the gradient. The max product semi-ring gives you the path with the highest value, that is the greatest gradient. And the expectation semi-ring gives you the entropy of a gradient graph. What do we mean by top gradient path? Consider all the paths between two nodes. Which one has the greatest value? What do we mean by entropy of the gradient graph? Consider all the paths between two nodes. If you consider each path as an outcome in a probability distribution weighted by its value, is this distribution very uniform across all paths, high entropy, or very focalized along a few paths, low entropy? And there's our method. Let's briefly highlight two experiments to show that semi-ring backpropagation can actually be useful. First, we wanted to validate. If the gradient is high along a path, does that actually correspond to the path's mechanisms being important? And second, if the answer to the previous question is yes, Hint, the answer is yes. What can this tell us in a typical NLP setting? For the first question, we specially designed a synthetic data set to check whether the top gradient path reflects how a transformer might solve a problem. Basically, it's a matching problem. Is the first token repeated in the input sequence? Now, why is this a good task with which to test transformer behavior? Well, recall how a transformer works. In its attention mechanism, the input gets transformed three ways into keys, values, and queries and they all get combined after some math with, along with the original input itself. How do the keys, values, and queries function? Well, each token in the sequence has a key, a value, and a query. The query of a token says, I'm looking for a thing that looks like me. The key of a token is sort of like its identifier, and the value is the actual value that gets used. The query of a token basically tries to look at the key of each token and find how well they match with the highest score given to the best matching one. Does that sound familiar? That's Quite similar to how the task itself is solved, you look at each token in the sequence and see if any of them match the first. So maybe the queries should be important for the first token and the keys should be important for the repeat? Let's talk results. Indeed, you do see that for the first token, the gradient through the queries path is the greatest. Yay! And for the repeat token, the gradient through the keys path is really the greatest. Yay! And for the other tokens, the gradient through the keys is the greatest, but it's all pretty low overall anyway. Triple yay! Now, with evidence that the top gradient path can tell us something about which mechanisms of a transformer are most important, let's apply it to a typical NLP setting. The task is subject-verb-number agreement, a common task used in model interpretability, and we use BERT, a popular transformer-based architecture. Subject-verb agreement basically asks, should a verb be singular or plural given the start of the sentence? And what do we find? Looking only at paths through the subject token at each layer, you find that the gradient flows mostly through the skip connection in earlier layers and the keys in the last. Now, if we think of SVA as another matching task where the answer depends on the subject, the keys being important actually kind of makes sense. We see a similar but smaller pattern for attractors, i.e. non-subject nouns, and compared to the baseline of all tokens, we see that the previous pattern is very different. In the baseline, the skip connection is highest for all layers. To summarize takeaways from this experiment, the skip connection matters a lot for earlier layers, and the keys matter most for the subject. Okay, let's recap. We talked about how backprop is a dynamic program using the sum product semi-ring, and we can generalize it to other ones and therefore see interesting things. The beauty of it all is this is just the tip of the iceberg. What semi-ring will you discover interesting things with?